Almost every major franchise in the current state of Hollywood has reached the point where the only idea anyone seems to come up with are safe retreads of the same things that we've seen before. Financially, this isn't a bad decision, as almost all these tentpole franchises made money on their initial return to theaters. Terminator Genesis, Jurassic World, Star Wars, The Force Awakens. Alien, on the other hand, has not really been successful. By all accounts, both movies lost money, because Prometheus was too different and Covenant sucked. So for a long time, many fans, myself included, thought the Prometheus trilogy was dead. Then came trailers for Alien Romulus, with a promise to put the horror back in Alien, and the trailer swept across YouTube by storm. And while armies of people are praising the movie as the best Alien sequel since Aliens, not a high bar, I stand resolute with my statement that Alien Romulus, just like Prey, Genesis, Force Awakens, and Jurassic World, is a bloated nostalgia trip that tricks you with surface-level details in the hopes you haven't started thinking for yourself. As a huge Alien fan, I'm not gonna hold back. So if you've seen the movie, then stay a while. If you haven't, then come back later, because I'm going in deep like a facehugger. Alien Romulus begins with a Wayland yutani vessel exploring the remains of the Nostromo. Yep, 30 seconds into the movie and we already have a major continuity problem. The vessel gathers a large chunk of debris and workers cut it open, carrying something off when the camera pans over the debris, revealing the imprint of an alien. We then jump over to Jackson Star Mining Facility and follow Rain and her brother Andy. Rain works on the mining colony and has completed the required hours to leave, but is denied as the numbers are increased. Meanwhile, Andy, a synthetic repurposed by Rain, Rain's late father to protect her and be her brother is attacked by some kids and spasms on the ground before Rain resets him. Up the road, Rain and Andy meet up with her friends, Rain's ex-boyfriend Tyler, Tyler's pregnant sister Kay, Tyler and Kate's cousin Bjorn, and Navarro, Bjorn's girlfriend and pilot. The group has a plan to escape Jackson's star, explaining scans reveal a small space platform in orbit over the mining facility. It appears to be derelict, so they plan to steal cryopods and use them to travel to a planet not under Whalen yutani control, called Ivaga. The group needs Andy because Andy's coding allows him to read Mother Code, the same from Alien. Agreeing, Rain, Andy, and the group head for the station. Tyler, Bjorn, and Andy head inside the facility, which has no power, unbreathable air and they must contend with the gravity generators. After returning power, the trio finds the pods lack the fuel to make the nine-year trip to Ivaga, so they search for more. They find some in a cryo chamber, and after some tomfoolery, the casing fails. The power somehow reverses and causes the room to lock down and heat up. This causes the facehuggers in the room to awaken and attack. Meanwhile, Rain and Navarro enter the ship to help while Kay stays behind to sleep. Rain pulls a disc from the damaged synthetic on the ship, Rook, and gives Tyler the disc so that Andy can upgrade. The group flees the facehuggers, but Navarro gets got. Rook then explains the situation to the group that the researchers found the remains of the Nostromo, found the original Xenomorph, which survived in space by cocooning itself, got loose, ravaged the ship, spawned more Xenomorphs for 50 minerals each, was finally gunned down, and now Navarro is most likely impregnated. The group removes the facehugger, but it's too late. Bjorn and Navarro return to the ship, and Andy tries to stop them. Navarro, about to die, wakes up Kay and starts seizing, then kicks the controls, causing the ship the group came in to veer away from the station, but in a super lucky way, ends up on the other side of the station and Kobe's into the hangar. Navarro dies, Bjorn and Kay are knocked out, and the chestburster runs off. Rain, Tyler, and Andy head for the hangar, but the facehuggers decided to jailbreak and just so happen to end up in the same hallway the group must enter. Instead of smashing through the glass, the facehuggers just sit by and wait for the group to concoct a plan. To get past, they heat up the room to match their internal temperatures as face huggers hunt via infrared and audio. Kay wakes up and Bjorn tries to kill the growing alien. Bjorn is injured and ends up underneath the pupa and dies because he doesn't know how to roll out of danger like a retard. The alien completes its evolution, putting a new entry in my Pokedex, and Kay calls Tyler. The headset on loudspeaker doesn't attract the face huggers until the plot says so, and the group runs off. They meet up with Kay, who is then taken by the alien because Andy won't open the door. Going around, Rain, Tyler, and Andy find a lab, and Rook overcomes explains the researchers on the station figured out the mutagen from Prometheus is the same as what they extracted from the Xenomorph. The goal was to use it to improve human potential. Andy grabs the vials the researchers somehow replicated, while Tyler teaches Rain how to use a pulse rifle with built-in auto-aim because he plays 
video games. Anyway, the three find the hive where Kay is still alive, but near death from blood loss. The xenomorph attacks, killing Tyler and knocking down Andy, who spasms. Rain gets Kay on the elevator and tells her to reach the ship with the mutagen, even though she's on death's door. Rain goes back for Andy, resets him, and guns down all the xenos after turning off the gravity. The two climb the elevator shaft after avoiding acid in a unique zero-gravity scene. Meanwhile, Kay used the mutagen to heal and reaches the ship. In the shaft, the zero-gravity activates and all of the xenos that Rain just blew apart with almost 400 rounds give chase. The gravity reactivates and the elevator comes crashing down when Andy, with one hand, catches it. He then lets go, killing most of the aliens, then jumps down and kills the lead Xeno with the pulse rifle. While straddling it, he blows it apart, doesn't get a drop of acid on him, and says... Get away from her. You bitch. Back on the ship, Rain, Kay, and Andy ready for their journey to Ivaga, when Kay suddenly becomes nine months pregnant, popping out an egg. Immediately, the baby hides and grows, becoming an eight-foot-tall human-engineer-alien hybrid. Yep, we're doing this again. The hybrid slashes Andy's throat, making him useless. Don't know how. It kills Kay, and Rain blows it out in airlock. Rain then gives a recording before entering cryosleep en route to Ivaga with Andy. There you go. I just saved you two hours of aggravation. Now, as I am fair, there are things that worked, and I will detail before I get into the negatives, as there are a lot. First, the visuals and setting. Romulus resembles a DLC expansion of Alien Isolation. It feels lived in with the scenes on Jackson Star, since we only ever got glimpses of everyday life in the extended cut of Aliens. So that was a nice change of pace. And with the exception of Rook's face being a rough CGI mask of the late Ian Holm, honestly, the rest of Romulus looks fantastic. CGI is used sparingly and indirectly to support scenes rather than as a crutch. Most effects are hidden in shadow, which makes everything feel more real, like the Rex breakout in Jurassic Park. Romulus also makes heavy use of practical effects. The vehicles and environment on Jackson Star, the set of the station, and most importantly, the alien itself being practical in almost all of its shots. I also appreciated the zero-gravity acid hallway. I'll get to why the situation makes no sense later, but it's a different obstacle none of the movies have done before, and in a movie almost entirely devoid of original ideas, this one stands out. So despite looking like Rain is ascending someone's nose for missions not possible, it is at least different. The screenwriting is pretty good, too. There are more setups and payoffs than there are aliens in this movie. Many are smaller and work fine, like Bjorn's hatred of synthetics, after his parents were left behind to die in order to save other workers at the Synthetics' orders. That hatred boils over when Bjorn bullies Andy just because he's an android. The zero gravity, while wasted in this movie, is brought back just when Rain and Andy think it's over in the hive until one of Andy's dad jokes makes Rain realize what could be done. These are fine and dandy, and when seldom or minor, like these examples, it works. When they don't is when there are so many that the story might as well be holding your hand, saying, I think you forgot about the baby. Oh, and here's the mutagen, and what does that mean for the baby? Yeah, thanks for saying baby over and over again. Now I feel like I'm sitting through Metroid Other M again, and any surprise you were hoping for ain't happening now. There are a few expansions and clarifications of the lore pertaining to the aliens that I also appreciate. First, and I'm going to harp on this a little later, but the Xenomorph's ability to produce a cocoon around itself and hibernate to survive in the vacuum of space is interesting. Survival in space had not been confirmed one one way or the other in the movies, as the original alien did try to hide in the shuttle's engine nozzle. Which does lead me to believe this was possible from the beginning. It also makes me chuckle, because that means the queen from Aliens is just cartwheeling through space in her own spit until either she crosses paths with some poor bastards or ends up in a star. Second is the clarification of how the facehuggers hunt. I didn't really need this, but I'm sure most people did. Romulus clarifies the facehuggers hunt by infrared and audio, as I mentioned before. So if your body temperature temperature is different from the surrounding area, the facehugger will most likely jump you. Same if you make a noise. Though this movie can't even play by its own rules, it is nice for casual fans to receive this info. Now, let's get into the problems. The writing, characters, aliens, choices, and everything that deals with the core function of a movie and sequel are awful. Romulus is like a fake ice cream sandwich. It looks great, smells great, but the second you bite into it, you realize someone actually just froze mustard. Hopefully, by the end of this, you'll understand why 
alien Romulus is from the same vein as Terminator Dark <laughs> Fate. Let's start with the characters. First up to bat, Rain. The lead of the movie, an orphan left to make her own decisions on Jackson's mining facility after her parents' deaths. She's helpful, resourceful, determined, and caring. She does what she can in the situation she's thrust into, and just like Shaw and Daniels, is an attempt to emulate Ripley. Despite looking like she's 17 in both this and Civil War, she steps up to fill the role of a survivor, complete with plot armor thicker than a xenomorph's carapace. I swear, Rain doesn't get more than a couple scratches. I've seen Looney Tunes take more damage. Other characters get hurt and die for her. Meanwhile, she looks at worst like she accidentally bumped a makeup kit. She blows apart the Xenos in the hive with zero gravity, and not a drop of acid touches her. She plummets to her death in the elevator shaft when the gravity generators reactivate, but she's caught by the alien. Even though she's clearly a threat to the Xeno and Hive, the alien doesn't immediately kill her. And the hybrid baby has more opportunities to kill Rain than a Clinton assassin. It just stands there in the shadows and giggles. How lucky do you have to be for the hybrid's tongue to not shatter your spacesuit's visor in space after multiple hits and spider cracking like you chucked your phone at the wall? Invulnerability, thy name is Rain. Next, Tyler, the Chad of the group and Rain's ex-boyfriend. Sharing many of Rain's qualities, Tyler doesn't really do anything to stand out. There were a couple times I mixed him up for Bjorn because they look so similar. His teaching Rain scene caused my eyes to roll backwards like Andy getting his upgrade. How do you know how to use this gun? I play video games. Are, are we kidding? The game we see them playing looks like Spectre for the Super Nintendo. Piss off you know how to use an M44 AA pulse rifle with built-in Chinese aimbot. That scene is the only one of significance Tyler has. He doesn't come up with plans or rise to an occasion. Tyler teaches Rain how to use the pulse rifle, then when he has the opportunity to use it, he panics and dies. Now for Bjorn, Tyler and Kay's cousin who hates synthetics. This dipshit has the situational awareness of a cross-eyed alpaca. He nearly falls into another reference. I mean, the multiple melted floors from aliens. When he attacks the xenomorph's pupa, he shoves the cattle prod into it and causes the acid to pour out, melting the grating below. So he knows that it can happen. Then, looking at the pulsating cocoon, sees a sharp object come out of it. Do you think A, he steps out of the way, or B, rolls a nat 1 intelligence roll? Of course it's B. He then lays under the thing, leaking the acid he saw dissolve the metal grating, and stays there until he dies. You know, instead of rolling out of the way. It was almost at this point I wanted to cheer on the alien, but the rest of the characters don't really piss me off enough. Except for Andy, Rain's adopted synthetic brother. He's kind and gentle, trying to make others happy even though he's different. After being reprogrammed to care for Rain, he also cracks down dad jokes to cheer her up, which is probably the best small detail in the movie, since Rain's dad is the one who reprogrammed him. However, my goodwill gets jettisoned into space shortly after he gets his upgrade from Rook's disc. He becomes assertive, calculating, and is revealed to have super strength. Dude, you can solve all the problems on this station by yourself, why aren't you? The facehuggers cannot and are not going to attack you, and since you can one-hand a multi-ton elevator, a xenomorph isn't going to be much challenge. Andy could run to the hangar, save Kay and possibly Bjorn, and be back before his dungeon finder cube pops. Oh, but Andy has to protect Rain and Tyler. All right, then he should just enter the hallway on his own and kill the facehuggers while they hide behind a corner. This is the most consistent problem with Andy. He can solve the problems at hand, but the plot doesn't compensate for his abilities, so he just stands there doing nothing, like most of the characters in this movie. He could have carried Kay with ease, but doesn't do it. He could have eliminated the facehuggers without fear of implantation, but doesn't do it. Andy he has the same problem in this manner as Captain Marvel did in Endgame. These characters are so strong in their perspective situations, the writers had to nerf their situational intelligence, like Andy, or remove the character entirely, like Plank, in order for the scripted events to play out. Otherwise, everything would be different. Oh, but what about the disc? What about the disc? Rain knows he could be knocked down and reset him while he spasms. The alien could attack resulting in the same thing. Or how about a moral program conundrum? Let's say Andy's character K, but he threatens to kill her if Rain and Tyler don't do what he says, so his new directive conflicts with Rain's dad's coding. There are many ideas that could be executed, but they didn't put in the work, so now we just have a robot that stands around doing nothing until the plot says so. Next, we have the pregnant sister, K. K is basically the only character I felt something for, and not because she's pregnant, though that's a way to do it. No, it's because she woke up to everything being absolutely fucked. That's basically K's whole character. She gets sick, goes to sleep, wakes up, Navarro dies in her arms, gets knocked out, wakes up again.
again, Alien stalks her, Alien impales her, super glues her to the wall, and she gives birth to the baby, and then the baby aborts her. If there was ever a character whose soul-defining trait is cannon fodder, it's K. Worse yet, it's really hard to convince me to be scared for K when the movie keeps telling me something is going to happen to her over and over again. Quick, open the door to help her! No. Alright, this is mine now. You couldn't convince me Kay wasn't put in the movie exclusively to be a voodoo doll for Rain. Kay is just as unmemorable as James Franco in Alien Covenant. Speaking of characters I only remember because I looked them up on IMDb, Bjorn's girlfriend Navarro. That's it. Nah, that's not fair, I should give more detail than that. Oh, she's an idiot. There's really nothing else to add. When Rain and Navarro enter the station to help Tyler, Bjorn, and Andy, Navarro stands at the door peering in. Tyler then says that there is something in the water. Okay, maybe Navarro didn't hear that. But she sees Bjorn inspecting the water in front of her. When Bjorn is dragged down by the facehugger, Navarro's like, What are you doing? Quit playing around. Are you kidding me? Dude just got pulled down into the water like Chrissy Watkins and you think he's playing around. Five minutes later, she gets face hugged anyway, so what does it matter? Navarro is lower on the totem pole of importance than most prisoners from Alien 3. The last character to go over is Rook, the horribly CGI'd mask of the late Ian Holm. Don't know why the extra money was spent on getting Holm's likeness and applying it. Could have just used the actor who portrayed him and saved all the money. Anyway, Rook is like Ash. He's a synthetic working for the company and is there to oversee operations. The difference is that he actually cares for humans wanting to improve us. Problem is, his prime director directive isn't important until the plot tells him to get up and do something. He's melted in half after the original Xenomorph is killed above him, and instead of trying to complete the company's directive, he just lays there face down in his own failure until Rain tries to pull the disc from him. He does explain the situation and offers advice to the group, sure. Besides that, he just lays about and does nothing when he could easily be of help. He's the same kind of synthetic as Andy, and as I've already discussed, if Andy has the capability of super strength, then so should Rook. It's stupid, but the bar was set. Don't blame me, blame the movie. He could have worked his way around and reactivated the systems to stabilize the station. He could have used the zero gravity to move greater distances with ease, but more on that later. Rook exists as a talking reference that espouses exposition and nothing more. Now with the humans and synths out of the way, let's go over the aliens. These things lays about the ship until the plot cracks its whip and makes them act. Until then, you could literally walk past them with no threat to yourself. Take the facehuggers, for instance. These bastards take center stage and are quite the threat. When they awaken in the cryo chamber, they relentlessly attack Tyler and Bjorn. When they escape, they chase after the group by smashing through the glass, eventually impregnating Navarro. Pretty ruthless, right? Well, not when the plot says so. Later, when Andy informs Rain and Tyler how the facehuggers hunt, the plan they come up with is to heat up the sectioned off hallway to match their body temperatures and walk through without any degree of change or sound. Alright, just a little question about this plan. Uh, how is this section of hallway supposed to remain at body temperature when you open the fucking door? Opening the door would mix the air temps and get Rain and Tyler got. Also, let's not forget they hunt by sound, so whenever Rain erratically breathes in fear or yelps when she's startled by a hanging body, the huggers do nothing. Oh, and when Kay calls Tyler over the comms, the little guys just sit there and do nothing. Again. They must have Bose noise-canceling headsets on, because according to the movie's own explanations, Rain and Tyler should be dead. Oh, and I almost forgot, before this plan even happens, a face humper launches itself at the glass of the window on the door and none of them break through the glass like they did earlier. That ain't enough? How about the lead xenomorph storming down the walkway when Rain, Tyler, and Andy are in the hive? The camera is from its perspective as it makes like Usain Bolt outrunning a speeding ticket towards them, but when it comes around the corner, it slowly skulks like it slammed the brakes. How about the rest of the aliens that exist? on the station. They don't pop up until Rain and the others enter the hive when they could have been hiding throughout. Instead, they were probably playing poker in the back room, waiting for the director to give them their cue. And then there's... The baby. Another doofy-looking design that, by the way, you may recognize. He's played by 7'7", seven seven former Romanian basketball player Robert Bobrovsky. Now, none of this is his fault, of course. The baby. Only does things when the plot gives the green
green light, as it is so often the problem. After disabling Andy before he's had time to open his eyes, it kills and starts eating Kay. Again, the standard has been set, so why does it start stalking Rain like Michael Myers with a restraining order? The baby. Has so many opportunities to kill her, you'd think that it was monologuing like Syndrome. Why even have the damn hybrid in the first place? With all of the characters out of the way, let's get into the world building and the inconsistencies, beginning with the opening of the movie. The Nostromo's self-destruction at the end of Alien included the refinery at Toad and resembled a supernova. How is there debris? Even if we assume there was, there wouldn't be debris in the area to check out because what little that could have survived the explosion would have been propelled into space in every direction faster than the Voyager. On top of that, the Xenomorph was in the area. Again, I'm okay with this tardigrade level of survival in extreme conditions. It, it makes the aliens that much scarier. That aside, the fact the Xenomorph's cocoon was even remotely in the vicinity of the Nostromo debris is asinine. Ripley launched that bastard with the thrusting force of the shuttle. It should be so lost in space you'd have an easier time finding the Robinsons. Another problem I have is yet again the inconsistent incubation period of the chestburster. The first three movies all kept things simple. It takes somewhere between 12 to 24 hours for a chestburster to mature. From resurrection onward, these things pop out of people like a microwaved hot pocket. I know the movies want to rush to things that the people want to see, but if you don't take the time to establish the horror better, then it doesn't matter because everything feels rushed and inconsistent. And what nostalgia bait would be complete without more nods than a 50s themed diner? Might as well call this movie Alien Reference for all the callbacks shoved down our throats. Things like Rain and Andy eating cornbread with the drinking bird in the background, or every so often, for those who have played Alien Isolation, there are multiple emergency telephone booths in the facility. These callbacks are fine because they do not interrupt the movie, they're just eye candy for fans to play I Spy with. Where the references become annoying or outright eye-rolling is when it's something we have already seen in another entry of the franchise or is a quote from another movie forced into the dialogue with all the tenderness of getting anally fisted by Wolverine. Tell me you've seen or heard these before. Ash, I mean Rook, quotes the Xenomorph as the perfect organism and tells the Scooby gang he calculated the odds and doesn't admire their chances. Or take Andy and his wonderful references. Early on, he quotes Bishop, referring to be called an artificial person, and then the later worst line of dialogue in the movie when he quotes Ripley. I think the lower lab scene is a good example where Ash, my bad Rook, explains to Rain, Tyler, and Andy the researchers found the xenomorph examples match the mutagen from Prometheus. The goal, again, being to grant humans the same resistances and strengths of the xenomorph. There is even a little video that shows a rat get smashed but then regenerates, showing the potential of the mutagen. Even though everyone in the room somehow missed the mutated rat dead on the desk looking like something straight out of Parasite Eve. Tyler then teaches Rain how to use the pulse rifle, and the group leaves with the mutagen samples. This whole scene is a four-way split between Alien, Aliens, Prometheus, and Romulus, because instead of focusing on creating its own unique story, more on that later, the movie is way too safe being a catch-all of the greatest hits of the franchise. And I'm gonna harp on that point. I've said it before, repetition is not a problem. The manner in which you retread old ground is what matters. Aliens, Predator 2, and Terminator 2 all work because the formula, while basically the same, has enough alterations that just like doing different exercises at the gym the next day shocks the system, the changes to the story and how those conclusions are reached separate these examples from their predecessors. The monotony of the exact same things over and over again without change is what sucks, and alien repetition is 99% been there, done that. Including the aforementioned scenes and references, someone finds a xenomorph that causes havoc. A synthetic betrays the humans. There is a corporate crony willing to sacrifice others for Whalen yutani There is a shootout with a horde of aliens. Someone dies from a chestburster. The hive with victims velcro to the wall. The last survivor records a message, and even a hybrid with a hint of engineer in it, just in case there weren't enough references for you. I get it. There are only so many things that can be done with a property. People get eaten in shark movies. Medieval fantasy is going to have a sword fight because those are the weapons of the time. But Alien is built different. The Xenomorph we know takes on features of its host, and if this movie really wanted to make an impact both on and for younger generations to distinguish itself from the rest of the franchise, then use the comics. There are a plethora of Dark Horse comics with interesting stories, or they could have just used the old Kenner line of toys for inspiration, like the Bull, Gorilla, and Scorpion aliens. The runner from Alien 3 was a success as far as I'm concerned, so why not take the concept further within reason 
season and capitalize on what could be fun, unique, and scary scenes for both the audiences to enjoy and the writers to create. For as much shit as I give Prey, a page could have been taken out of that book, because Prey did exactly what fans suggested by putting the Predator in a different era and setting. This isn't rocket science. I know I'm asking for too much, but I can dream, Harold. The last thing I want to touch on that frustrates me about Romulus is the discourse around the movie. I have not seen many other reviews, I often don't see any, but I've seen a lot of arguments online trying to defend this movie and the many issues of the story and setting. Some of these arguments online you'd think were written by Chinese contortionists. Take for example why the research station was derelict above Jackson Star and no one checked it out prior. The scientists most likely traveled to Jackson Star to test the Z01 serum on the workers there. However, I've seen arguments claiming that messages sent to the company back on Earth would take six months, so of course, no one found the station. No one else with a scanner higher up the corporate ladder could spot, communicate, or want to investigate the station? And if we reverse the questioning, why didn't anyone in the facility request security forces from Jackson Star? Even if they didn't want humans to come up and help, then why not synths? Speaking of which, Rook is still operable. Why didn't he try to communicate with the mining outpost? Oh yeah, he laid there for a stupid jump scare. How about Rain getting caught by the Xenomorph? The claim for that one is it's trying to grow the numbers of the Hive. Well, that doesn't explain why the Xeno killed Tyler. There's a secondary argument that goes hand in hand with this one, claiming the reason the Xeno killed Tyler is because it recognized the pulse rifle and therefore Tyler as a threat. Except the tail stab was intended for Rain not Tyler, so the Xeno would have killed her in the same manner. Second, this isn't the original Xenomorph. The original was gunned down by security before Rain and her friends arrived, so this one wouldn't know what a pulse rifle is or does. So killing Tyler doesn't work when he didn't pose a recognizable threat. Moments later, when Rain mows down the Xenos, the lead alien should then want to kill Rain when she's at its mercy because she is a threat. Besides, the franchise is littered with people who pose as much of a threat to an individual alien or or the Collective as a Teletubby fighting Godzilla, and yet they get murked like it's the Purge. Just kill her, and fuck your Alien 3 reference. The other I've seen defended is the 20-year search for the Cocoon. Except that doesn't work, because as stated before, the Cocoon should be hurtling into space. Ripley never states in her log what she did to the Xenomorph, so Wayland yutani couldn't possibly have any point of reference to begin searching, let alone know the trajectory the alien traveled, which she didn't reveal until 37 years after the events of Romulus. I get a lot of people like Alien Reference, but that's because the standards of so many have been lowered so much that even bad movies are considered good nowadays, unironically. Alien Romulus is to the Alien franchise what Prey is to Predator and Genesis is to Terminator. It lures you in with decent enough ideas that take place in the universe, promising to not directly tie to any events with good aesthetics. Then pulls the rug out from under you, front-loading the movie with a ton of references stupid characters, bad writing, dumb choices, inconsistencies, and more in the hopes that you won't start thinking for yourself. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.